Hello everyone and welcome to this edition of the Seneca webinar series where Andrew Stubbs from the Erasmus Medical Center will present Practical Affair. My name is Marta Llorel Linares and I'm involved in the Seneca project on behalf of MBLEBI. I would like to make you aware that this webinar is being recorded, including the question session at the end and the recording will be available in the Seneca website and the Seneca YouTube channel. At the end of the session, we have preserved some time for uh, questions from the audience. So if you have any questions, please write them in the questions box of the GoToWebinar application, as you can see on the slide. I will briefly introduce the Seneca project to you. Seneca stands for Common Infrastructure for National Cohorts in Europe, Canada and Africa. And it's a four-year project funded by the European Union's Horizon 2020 program and the Canadian Institute of Health Research. Seneca's vision is to accelerate disease research and improve health by facilitating transcontinental human data exchange. To achieve this, Seneca is addressing several challenges. The first one is federated data discovery. So how, as a researcher in a particular domain, you find cohort data of interest. And this could be for a particular phenotype or genotype. And then once you find the data, you will need to get permission to access it. So Seneca is working in, on an interoperable authentication and authorization infrastructure. And once you get access uh, to the data and want to ask questions across cohorts, there will be a need for a harmonized cohort level metadata. The ultimate aim of Seneca is to enable federated data analysis for research and healthcare applications. So Seneca has a set of demonstrators across cohorts in both uh, research and clinical settings. And on top of all these challenges, there's a fundamental need for a transnational harmonized LC framework to address ethical, legal and societal issues. Seneca has also an outreach and training program to increase awareness and build capacity in these areas. The um, webinar today is part of the um, event, How Fair Are You?, which consists of a webinar series and a hackathon to provide background knowledge and practical advice in order to facilitate the uptake of fair approaches. This is the fourth webinar in the series and we'll still have two more on, train, on making training fair and ethics and LC considerations in regards to fair. And at the end of April, there will be a hackathon, which is a practical online event where we'll work on the implementation of the fair principles in three parallel streams, cohort data, software, and training materials. If you want to know more about this event and register for it, visit the Seneca project website. Today's presenter, Dr. Andrew Stapps, is an associate professor in the Department of Pathology and Clinical Bioinformatics. The Stapps group is focused on artificial intelligence in healthcare, translational bioinformatics, and fair data management in translational and clinical research. His group has applied machine learning to discriminate bacteria from viral infections to reduce the use of antibiotic treatment and deep learning to deliver predictive models from multiomics experiments to improve patient stratification in pancreatic cancer patients. His team are the Dutch lead for the European Galaxy project and have implemented Galaxy servers and services supporting cancer research, metagenomics, and for immune repertoire analysis. Fair data management is a prerequisite for reproducible science and required by all H2020 projects. To address this requirement, they have developed a cloud-based FAIR data management and analysis platform, MyFAIR, for use in the Seneca project. At this point, I will hand over to Andrew. Um, thank you for the opportunity to talk today, and uh, I would like to take you on a small journey that uh, we've progressed through in our hospital to understand how to ap apply FAIR data practically in our hospital. Hence the title, Practically Fair. Um, sorry, I think there is an issue with my slide going down. Ah, so excuse me. So uh, I'd like to take you through an outline of the presentation today. Today I would like to go through genomics in healthcare, 
fair genomics in healthcare, fairer and practically fairer. I'll explain what these are throughout the presentation. So in a hospital and many other approaches to healthcare treatment, we realize that uh, the percentage of patients on the left-hand side, which actually respond to drugs, is, is quite dramatically variable, depending on the class of drug, from depression all the way up to cancer, in some cases where the, the actual drug treatment can be infect, in, ineffective. So up to 75% of those patients receiving treatment actually do not receive treatment that is effective for them. So hence, in the center of this uh, slide, we have the traditional approach where individual comes in, symptoms are uh, evaluated, and then they're treated with a general combination of drugs or, or protocol. And hence, we have benefits, no effects, or adverse events in the worst case. The aim in medical research now is to move towards this precision-based personalized medicine, where we can actually stratify the patients up front based on their multi-omics or genomics approaches and clinical healthcare approaches as well, and then identify which of those class of patients fit with which treatment. Of course, this is also dependent on the types of treatment that, that are available, but our aim is to end up with a system and a protocol where patients benefit and have either no effect removed or the adverse effect diminished. Of course, that's many different types of data can be involved in healthcare monitoring. And what we see here in this slide is a concept of where genomics fits into healthcare. Of course, I've just presented the slide before precision medicine, where we look at accelerated and targeted treatment. We look at pharmacogenomics to understand how we can associate the right dose with the right individual for the right treatment. And of course, then there are many other areas in there, such as complex and rare diseases. In the pathology department, we also work on pathogen genomics as well, and including in that is infectious diseases and infectious control. The lower right-hand side will look at novel therapeutics, drug target and drug target discovery, which is also important in our area of research. Of course, being a, a pathology department, we don't really deal with much of this, but there is, of course, population health and health changes, which is the lower left corner. And of course, there is a very important part in our uh, horizon uh, projects now, which is looking at disease risk and prognosis and prevention and response to screening. How do we put the right individual into the right treatment to make sure that we optimize their treatment response? How does this fit together in a day-to-day -day working in a hospital and probably some other healthcare settings? On the left-hand side, we have a, an image of how the process of the data life cycle in genomics in a healthcare setting works. We, of course, have the consultation at the top, and we have this cycle of data capture. First, there are the lab staff, and those lab staff who capture the sample actually process the sample and move that to data generation in a sequencer. The sequencer, of course, exports data files. Those data files have to be managed. They have to be correlated with the clinical patient systems. Those systems then move that data from the data management onto data analysis. The data analysis can either be local or remote. And then, of course, we go into data integration, collecting that data uh, as a summarized or final report into clinical bioinformatics system, which is then moved back to the clinicians, where the clinicians report back the result all the way to the uh, consultation and the patient. So we can see on the right-hand side, we have three main components there. We have the clinical data, which needs to be anonymous in a system that we use in research in the future. And of course, we need clinical genomics NGS platforms, which are both internal and external to the hospital. And also the genomics analytical work workflows, which can be both internal and external. And the slide at the bottom, I think, was also presented in this series, where it shows that from 2012, 1% of the whole genomes and exomes were funded by healthcare, and it's projected that in 2020, 80% of those genomes will be funded. We also have the projects within the hospital and other research centers where we're looking at translational research. The left-hand side, this represents a design for an experimental design for cancer treatment monitoring. The top is where the patient receives no treatment, and we see the progression of driver mutations almost equal abundance in the different colors of the cell types, whereas in the treated person, then the patient goes through various protocols until there is a removal of certain 
a certain clone, and then the treatment is uh, changed such that clonal outcome occurs, and we get higher abundance of those clones. This is monitored by many multiple multiple omics data types. So on the right hand side, we see the type of genomics and transcriptomics, but of course, there are many other types of omics. We have tumor genome sequencing, we have tumor normal exome sequencing, and we have transcriptome sequencing. And what we're trying to find out, of course, if you're involved in the cancer field, point mutations of many different formats, missense, nonsense, frame shifts. We're looking at copy number, which includes structural variants as well, translocations, fusions, inversions. And of course, with transcriptomics, we want to understand the mechanism and whereby we understand the expression of those mutated and trans, uh, transcribed genes into pathways as well. Well, that's a summary of sort of where we are in the field of medical genomics in the healthcare setting. If I move on to fair genomics in healthcare then, what is fair genomics? I think you've been presented many times with what fair is, findable, accessible, interoperable, interoperable and reusable. But what does this mean in practice? If we look on the left-hand slide, and this slide was taken from one of my colleagues in another project, in the Fair Genomes project, we have the NGS analysis workflow. And at the top, the patient comes in and we want to know what type of phenotype. The second is what type of data sharing will be allowed. Second is which is the tissue was sampled, what sample kit was used, what type of NGS machine was used, and what type of software, et cetera, and what protocol. If this is fair, as we see on the right-hand side, we will be able to gather all of this data in a structured way, which is very similar to how information is stored under HL7 and Odyssey-like structures for healthcare. But this is not the same as structuring data for generalized workflows and analytical workflows for, um, for genomics and uh, fair genomics. So it is possible, and we're involved with a project with other colleagues in the Netherlands called the Fair Genomes. So this is our first part. This is the data management within fair genomics. Fair Genomes is a project with uh, 61 people from 14 institutes, as you can see there. And it's the aim to develop national guidelines and to promote the reuse of NGS data in research and healthcare. So we have a picture on the right hand side of the multiple hospitals and institutions that are involved. And there is a GitHub link on these slides to actually get you to this project. Within this project, we've actually demonstrated and developed a fair genomes semantic model. This is part of the group of uh, Maurice Schwartz who's uh, heading this, uh, this uh, work package and pro project. So the aim is there to combine the study with a person, our personal information. We have consent in that model. We have material, of course. We have clinical information. We have individual consent where possible. And we have sample preparation, sequencing, and analysis. This is all the data that we need to put together such that we can mon monitor not only where the genome came from, what, it, what was done to it, how we analyzed it and how we processed it and whether we identify variants of significance or, uh, or non-significance within that genome to report back to the individual patients. And we have a GitHub link there, link there at the bottom to identify the rest of this project. What does it look like in practice? This is taken from a slide and, uh, that was presented uh, uh, on, the, on the project. It's an overview. So we have this generalized workflow again where we go from contact to the patient, informed consent, sample collection, sample processing, measurements you can see, bioinformatics processing, clinical interpre interpretation, whether it's benign, pathogenic, or VUS, variant of unknown significance. And then, of course, this report then can be passed back in a structured way to the reporting uh, individuals who will report this back uh, in a careful way back to the patients. So we have clinical information. We have several types of uh, phenotypic data that we've identified and ontologies, which are all structured and standardized and available for reuse by other groups. We have the technical information, the metadata that relates to the sequencing platform, the guidelines, the standards in there, um, the compulsory dates, the value types in there. The bottom we have, of course, the minimal patient information. Sometimes it's not available within a, a research setting to store the patient ID. So we have to be aware of patient security, but it can be um, an anonymized patient ID that fits with this data type as well, if it's being run for a research-like research uh, community. 
And of course, we also have the materials, standardized sampling uh, data sets that relate to this process. That's all well and good. So now we know how to store data in a structured way using these types of processes, but we need to share that data between different groups. One of the communities that was set up maybe five years ago to look at how to share that data um, using the GA4GH, the Global Alliance um, for Health. And this community sets up standards, file formats, APIs, recommendations, metadata standards, genotype to phenotype, and unified uh, and consensus donor agreements and proof of project concepts to try and structure and allow us to work with this data cross sites and even cross country and cross continents. How does it work? It's a very simple process in some way. The concept means that a researcher or a scientist contacts these beacons via a, a web interface, a GUI, and that beacon will send back whether there is an individual, not named, but whether that individual has that variant or that feature. So the first beacons, of course, started off just looking at chromosome start end and position and variant. But in the future, they can actually identify whether that individual in that set has a copy number, structural variant, or other some sort of complex structural rearrangement. So we can see here on the left hand side, the researcher contacts these beacons. The beacon sends back, do I have that individual or not? Or yes, if I do, then the researcher can contact that uh, group of data scientists or hospital to see whether they can correlate their research findings with the other uh, researchers. How does it work in practice? Well, there's a website already available um, and there are several tools and a complete repository of how to set these beacons up. We in this hospital, and I know at Master, at um, Kroninger as well, are thinking of setting up a beacon to, to light up our genomic alleles. So you can see on the left hand side there, um, they're looking at how alleles change amongst a particular data set. And the, the query is, do you have allele C at, at position 32 million on the chromosome 13? And the result comes back as yes. And likewise, on another set of genomes for another researcher, they're looking at different, the similar position at uh, all different beacons. And we see it says it's lit up at beacon X, Y, and Z, either yes, no, or yes. So this is a very simple way for individuals to communicate securely and anonymously across sites to see whether that research data is available at other locations. Beacon goes beyond that, of course. There are beacons which start off with the discovery phase, as you've seen. You identify which content is available at which site. The second phase is then to go for a data access process. So this is asynchronous to actual data recovery that you have now. So when you log on to a web, web page, for example, the EBI or the ENA or the EGA, and you query that website, if it's public data, it will be available to you immediately for download or reuse or to move to a different workflow. However, if it is restricted access, then you need to apply for DAC access. So it becomes asynchronous. That asynchronous data is then sent to you via secure ID and you can access that data from that site, whichever of those beacons are available, whichever have activated this data access. So we have different levels, of course. We have level zero, which is closed data, only access to the controller or to the local site, accessed by all data subjects, level one, and then we have access by community members. These may be a group of people working on a project. And of course, we have level three public data, for example, public data in the TCGA or in the GWAS catalogs at, uh, at uh, the uh, EBI and at the US sites. Where would we go with this project then? Well, we now have a capability that allows us to connect to different hospitals and identify whether those variants are present in which site. So on the left-hand side, the first beacon implementation for hospitals, which of course we have to be careful in hospitals because of our data privacy, data security. We have to make sure that these beacons are ring fenced off so they're safe, so that the rest of the hospital system is not open to attack by external hackers. And we have an example here where we have three hospitals. Three hospitals have their data in different formats. Hospital CS databases, Hospital uh, B has a database and Hospital A has file servers that provide data. 
course, what Beacon does is it translates this into a standardized format. And that means the users at each of those sites can light up their beacon. And then we can make it such that queries can be queried against those beacons to identify if a pathogenic or non-pathogenic variant was sequenced at another hospital, providing each of those hospitals in the capability to actually contact that hospital, whether it's in the European Union, outside the European Union as well, and identify whether those variants are truly pathogenic or non-pathogenic within the phenotypes that are probably stored behind the file. Of course, we want to go beyond this. The aim would be to have sets of beacons and beacon networks, such that we have different hospitals where there is a secure network and these beacons can communicate with each other using something like their API connectivity so that we can communicate automatically, still using these secure shared procedures and allowing us to identify automatically across these beacons which variants are different and which variants are pathogenic. And also making sure that we do not compromise the patient confidentiality. This, of course, is the uh, goal in the future, not now. Where do we move towards? Well, of course, for us, we want to go to a, a next level. We have FAIR, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. We want to go to FAIRer. And why do we need to create this FAIRer analysis? And I'll explain what FAIRer is in a moment. So if we start off, we know, and this has probably been presented many times, we have a problem with reproducibility. Reproducibility of standardized sets of data, finding the data first, and secondly, in how to reuse that data in a structured way in a standardized pipeline. So we can have a standardized pipeline that runs at one location, and that location copies their pipeline or copies their method, and it doesn't work at a second location. Packages, rep, um, uh, reproducibility within the types of data. Uh, it can be anything from the lab uh, protocols to the types of water used as well. So it's not just in informatics, it's a whole life cycle. And here we see two reviews, one about the reality check and the second one about the um, number of scientists that reviewed, I think it was in 2016, 52% said there's a significant crisis in reproducibility of experiments. And even with our, in our own uh, unit here, we've actually tried to reproduce a methodology, a fully outlined methodology from 2019. And we found that three of the parameters were missing, which meant that after a week and a half's work, we could not reproduce the results produced in an informatics paper, which is quite worrying. So what do we want to do? We want to go beyond FAIR, and that is FAIR. Uh, we want to be practical. We cannot employ everything in a hospital system, not straight away. So we need to do a stepwise approach. So we start off with being fair. And what we want to do, of course, in a hospital, in a hospital research, is make sure we're reproducible and, and are able to replicate the results. And I'll explain what that means in the next slide. So we have reproducible, rep replicable, robust, and generalizable. The most simplest one that we want to do is actually to reproduce data analysis. Same data, same analysis. This is a reproducible piece of work. We want to replicate it. We want to use different data with the same analysis. So that means we take different data of the same data type, and then we want to run the same analysis and we should get the same result. Ideally, if we make a classifier or we generate some signature, that identifies a prognostic or diagnostic outcome, um, we need to be robust as well. So ideally then we take the same data, we run different analysis, and we want to make sure that that data and that analysis are robust. And finally, of course, where we'd like to go is to be generalizable. Different data, different analysis, end up with the same results. It's a very simple outline, but this shows, you this shows the stages that we need to work towards in medical healthcare to make sure that we uh, project, project the right uh, outcomes to our patients. What solution have we employed to try and solve this? One of the biggest projects in the European Union now is Galaxy. It's a data analysis platform, open source, web-based, easy to use. It has, as it says here, something like 8,000 tools. There are three main sites running this, one in the US, one in Europe, and one in Australia. These are all open servers that allow anybody 
with a, an institution um, uh, ID to log on to them to use their tools. On the right hand side, you can see an example of the web interface. It is always the same structure. It has on the left hand side a set of tools, on the right hand side the history, the steps that you've gone through, and in the center the sort of workspace or analysis space. Every time you click a tool on the left hand pane, the blue pane, this is moved into the central pane, which is the working or reporting pane, and as you join those together, you, s you set up a workflow. These workflows can be shared with other individuals, shared across sites, shared across galaxies, and it allows a structured approach to running workflows. In the bottom, you can see an example, an end-to-end -end workflow. This is a representation of what's stored within Galaxy, and the graphical view is actually portrayed in Galaxy so that you can actually follow that workflow. For example, here we see how the exons and SNPs are joined, they're compared with two data sets, and we identify which groups have different types of SNPs and exons in those sets. One click from a Galaxy workflow, you can process many, many hundreds to thousands of data sets within this simple uh, graphical user interface. Galaxy is not just for genomics, and I just wanted to make sure that was clear. In the top box here, we have a sort of understanding as I see uh, another research scientist of what genomics is. We are on the left hand side, we have the genome, and we have the epigenome, and then of course we have the transcriptome, we have the proteome, and the metabolome. So we move all the way from the central store of information to the transcribed and methylated store, the regulatory store, all the way to the yeah, the utility, the proteome and the metabolome. So, of course, we have on the right-hand side phenomenal. Phenomenal is an application that is allows you to analyze metabolites in a structured way, very similar to that you would see in Galaxy P at the bottom for proteomics, peak finding, peak description, um, statistical testing. We also have metabolites, uh, uh, Galaxy, v, Galaxy M, which is a metabolites database that allows you to analyze all different processes that go on with met analyzing metabolites in this type of system. And of course, at the bottom left there, we have image processing as well. So Galaxy is effectively a giant wrapper tool. That means we can wrap tools underneath, but keep them in a provenant way so we know which version was run, how it was connected to the next data set, and how it was processed and what parameters. In one go, we can go from the end to end of importing data to running data to the statistical or machine learning methods which predict outcome and classifiers in one environment. That environment ensures that you maintain your provenance of data, your provenance of workflow, and your provenance of parameters. So it truly is a fair way of managing data and uh, analysis. Of course, the most topical is that Galaxy has been used now for COVID research. Uh, earlier uh, last year, several research groups uh, developed this platform so that we have now genomics evolution, chemoinformatics workflows, proteomics, uh, and uh, Amplicon, and also direct sequencing. Uh, all tools and workflows here are available on all hubs. There are six different types of analysis, as I've mentioned. Um, there are five different Galaxy servers running, including Galaxy Australia, and the tools are available and allow reproducible workflows and reproducible data access from the primary data sources across multiple servers to all researchers uh, within the research community. How does it fit together? Well, of course, data is uploaded to the uh, on the left-hand side to the primary data hubs. These can be the COVID data portals as seen in this presentation here. The data is then processed through one or five, or what, one of the many workflows as presented in the center for the Galaxy project. That means because it's in a Galaxy workflow environment, you can plug in new environments, new workflows, new tools as the research develops into how to identify COVID research and COVID uh, identification. Of course, the end part is we want to visualize this. And what they've done in the COVID beacon project is actually create a beacon where the researchers can go, all open access, to access all of the sequence processed and structured data, and all of that data is stored in a beacon environment, which is publicly available and publicly accessible. Of course, what you end up with then is a set of reports 
left hand side bottom shows a set of reports. You can go to the, the consensus FASTA sequence, which are presented in Next Range Genome Browser. And of course, as I said before, the downstream variant analysis provides us uh, uh, access to the beacon, which uses all the variant call files processed in this project. This means we have a way to structure our data into containers. So I've presented, of course, here Galaxy. It's one of the applications that we use most heavily in our group, and we also deploy it to many different groups. But this is not one program that uh, is available. We use it in a framework that is provided by Elixir, where we are one of the Elixir partners. And of course, there are many different components in there. There's a biodiscoveries portal. We have the open workbench portal, which allows us to access different types of tools other than Galaxy. And of course, there are packaging services that we use, Bioconda and Biocontainer, to make sure that we ensure reproducibility throughout this whole process. And last but not least, something that's very important is training uh, and education and dissemination of these tools. We have our own training program. One of my colleagues here, two of my colleagues, sorry, work on the Galaxy training network and they provide open services, open access to all tools that we provide and others provide for the Galaxy services. So where are we going with this? We're going to what I call practically fair. Uh, fair. How do we put this together? A solution 101. First part is we have access now to beacons. Beacons allow us to find data, allow us to structure that data. Um, and colleagues in the uh, Seneca project, uh, it's mentioned here, one of the last authors is Thomas Keeney, he's the lead on the Seneca project. Him and his colleagues developed a HDS go to get protocol that allows secure streaming from beacon sites. So effectively, this was published in 2019. There is a GET request. That GET request goes to an affiliated site. The GET request brings back that data and reconcatenates all that data on the remote service. For example, if we called it from Erasmus Medical Center, we would call the EGA or EBI that would download that data and securely transfer it to our site. So that's phase one. We have a capability now to query large data sets securely in a structured way, standardized based on the Beacon protocol and securely stream that into different workflows. So what did we do at Erasmus? We took this process and we identified that in step one here, you have the discovery phase, you query a Beacon, you then request data, which is secured behind a uh, that firewall. So you have to go through the data access process. That data access process is released. An email is sent to me, so it's an asynchronous process. And then part two, we can log in and stream this data with HDS GET. So uh, my colleagues at Erasmus and I have implemented this HDS GET streaming as a tool within Galaxy. The lower portion of this uh, slide shows that there is a login and stream access. This is provided by the AAI Access Control Group. They're part of uh, Seneca as well as the uh, um, uh, Elixir AAI uh, Data Control Access. On the left-hand side, we have the permissions. Those permissions are given to a broker. When I log into Galaxy, as you'll see in a moment, I log into the Galaxy, I have a passport. The passport tells the broker who I am, and then it releases access to that data and that data is available for me to use within Galaxy. So for those who haven't used Galaxy, when you log into Galaxy, it asks me to either come in as an anonymous user and I can use the tools that are available there. When I leave, then all those data and workflows are removed from the system. However, I can log in as a user. On the bottom lower hand corner, you can see Welcome to Galaxy. I can log in normally or I can use my Elixir login ID. That login ID can be one of many. And the one I've chosen here is my uh, ORCID ID. I use my ORCID ID and when I log in there, it takes me to the Galaxy page in those Galaxy service tools. I can log into this tool. I haven't listed it, but I can press execute and it knows now who I am in the system and will identify which data, which tools are available from that remote site to be securely downloaded to the Galaxy of my choice, either intern, internal to the hospital or external if it's going to be a public project. What can we do with this data? So we can download any type of data now. 
securely from these sites where we've identified content using a beacon service? Is there a data set that contains all the pancreatic data sets for those tumors that have a KRAS mutation? Yes, we can download that. That means then we need to process it. Within Galaxy, there have been several uh, developments so far. This is a paper from 2017 though, and it's already been provided a whole suite of tools to allow us to analyze multiple genome data sets, tumor normal, to see how those variants vary within and across different tumor sites. So this one was uh, developed by uh, Albuquerque et al. Uh, it's presented in, in GigaScience. The tools are fully available in the Galaxy suites. And we can see at the top right, we have a set of genes, a set of samples. We can identify which are mutated and which are not. We can identify which are the current genes. Are they present as driver or non-driver? Are they variants of significance or insignificance? We can see in uh, the lower right-hand slide, their frequency in samples, their variant class type, which genes are available, the SNV class, the variant classification, a full repertoire. And then we can see at the bottom left, a summary using the standardized circus plots of how the copy number and gene expression changes either within one sample or across many samples for the whole uh, genome architecture within the human genome. But where are we going with this? Well, we have developed a tool ourselves called MyFair. MyFair is a prototype tool. On the left-hand side, you can see just a graphical user interface, just a schematic view. It's a Python-based uh, service that runs in the cloud. This cloud service will be available soon. Uh, we have prototyped it locally and using the Italian Indigo Cloud, or the European Open Science Cloud. It allows you to connect any analytical pipeline in Galaxy to the service. The service contains users, it contains data sets, and usually we access uh, our data, which is structured in a FAIR data hub, but I've now replaced this icon with, of course, the FAIR genomes. It can connect to any Sparkle endpoint, and then in our case, we will use FAIR genomes to structure our data internally. We will then use MyFAIR to manage our data, and we use any of the workflows that we've developed both internally at Erasmus or externally. Data can be transmitted and transferred to other galaxies with uh, secure access, either using your AAI ORCID ID or just using your standardized login password, and my fair of track that. On the right-hand side here, we have a standardized public trio analysis, sort of example of what you would see when you listed all your analysis from my fair. You would have the input files. Uh, on the left-hand side, you would have your data analysis or workflow and you'd have your output files. By clicking on the input files, you could actually go down to that service and identify those files. Say they were FASTQ or BAM or whichever, you could actually load those into the system and actually view them. The data analysis is a full provenance of which tools, which data, what processes have gone on in that service to identify those variants. This is a very basic view we have now. And our aim is to migrate all of this back into Gal Galaxy so that the service is no longer a standalone, but it's an integrated part of a Galaxy service. And of course, the output file here is just a, a link to a text file. But as you saw in the previous slide, we can link that to all of the reporting tools that are available in those Cancer Galaxy uh, output files. So in summary, uh, I'd like to show you, and hopefully I've shared with you, there are barriers within uh, using FAIR genomes and FAIR data. So for us, the barriers are privacy uh, and security. Uh, and to use FAIR genomes across hospitals, this can be addressed, hopefully, as we've tried to do it using these tools presented today, which are all open source tools, and all links are fully available to all users who, who access those tools. Um, the FAIR concept, fairer concept and associated applications uh, we think are essential for valid clinical and translational research, reproducibility, replicability, uh, robustness and generalized solutions go on top of the FAIR data itself. And we think that the combination of Beacon, FAIR genomes and Galaxy together provide a simple framework to deliver fairer services to the medical 
and translational research community, even without the uh, small MyFair component that we're working on. And we think that, yeah, better practical FAIR applications are needed uh, to be developed to improve the uptake beyond what we have developed in these uh, presentations already. So I'd like to thank you for your time. I'd like to acknowledge my team, Sanski Heltman, Helena Rash, Willem de Koning, uh, Jeju, Theodora Tan Tan Trandifar, Willem, uh, de David Van Zessen and Yan Lai Yi. Uh, I'd also like to thank our fabulous colleagues. I think this presentation has been shown before and also Marta and Daniel for today's meeting. And I think I'm open for questions. Thank you very much, Andrew. So yeah, if you want to share your webcam now, I guess it could be good for the question session. So yeah, and anyone can add questions in the question box, as you can see on the slide in the GoToWebinar application. Uh, and then we'll ask them to Andrew. Andrew, I will start with a kind of general question about what do you think are the next steps to make these fairer approaches more widespread uh, among yeah, researchers or medical? I, I think the, the difficult part people have is the complexity of the applications. Even for us, it's quite a difficult setup to get these applications running. Dockerization, making them in a format that's easy to use yeah, is, is going to make it more applicable and more amenable to medical researchers. Not many people have access to a bioinformatics department all the time to set these things up. Uh, and of course, what you want is something that's robust and works out of the box, ideally. Most re medical research software is quite flaky. <laughs> Even if it's in a GitHub, we know that it's going to take some effort to get it going. We're used to that, you know. Uh, I do think the community activities are important. Galaxy is a big community. It's been going for many, many years, and we get lots of support to make sure it's maintained. And the yes, the maintenance of that project is is very important because it means that any errors in that project are identified by researchers and fixed by not only the primary researcher but by other people who are also working on that project. So there is also a, a regulation of how software is implemented. It's tested thoroughly before it's put onto the main Galaxy site. So you can have your own development site, but before it gets passed, it has to be tested internally. That means the software you know is going to run. Yes? Thank you, Andrew, for the presentation. I also had a, had a question, uh, sure. if I may. When you were talking about the... Um, uh, reproducibility, the problem of getting something that it's written in a publication and then you try to repeat it in yourself and it doesn't work. It, it reminds me of my times also in the, in the laboratory. And I, I also kind of remember that at the same time when you had to write down your methods for, for a manuscript, for a paper, there is this problem that in the end you cannot dedicate much time to them, much space to the methods in a, in a paper. So how in the end it's like a kind of a cycle that you don't do it, you don't do it because you don't find it, you don't find it because you don't do it. So sure. where do we start breaking this, the circles? Is it the, the journals we have to engage with or also of course at the community, other researchers communities? That's a very good question. I think um, we should have standardized places where methods are stored and we should link to those because writing them over and over again is error prone as well. You probably get to the end of your work and say, I did this, did I use 10 mils, three mils? It's something like that. And so I can imagine that ideally what you want to do is say, this is what I used, I did this, I didn't really change it, let's keep that. I think writing this down also takes up space. And yeah, if you did it and you, you were correct in it, then that's where you should store it. And it should be electronic in some way. That's something we think is very important. Fair data came to us. It's, we started, I think, four years on this project or more to try and implement it. We're still struggling with the fair part because of the ontologies. That's very difficult to go from scientific to medical ontologies, from scientists to medical people. They have different views. Um, and also the technical parts in the informatics as well. These are also difficult. Tagging, I would say, is something very important. I tried to implement it here where you just tag something with an ontology. 
and also bring in ontologies. You go to the data that you're using and say, I will use that ontology and I will tag my data with it. Because if you read that article, you know what that is. You believe that's correct. Okay, maybe the terms don't match, but then we need a lookup service, a sort of say a, a greedy lookup service that helps you to identify what that is. And if you agree, that's what it is. Now we don't have that. We force people to go through these long protracted steps, which are really difficult and people don't want to do it. I mean, the professors I talk to here say, if it changes how I do my work, I won't use it. That's where we're at. And I'm very, that's why I say practical. What can I do to make sure that they use it instead of, yeah, just abandon it, yeah. True, thank you. No problem. So we have a specific question about um, the, the tools you have talked about. Yes. Um, can beacons be accessed from within Galaxy? Uh, you can soon. <laughs> we are releasing that HGS uh, GET client. But if you just want to query, you just go to the Beacon site. I'm sorry, I didn't include a slide. I was putting all the resources on. And I'll put that an extra slide with all the resources at the end as well. So we have links to all of those. Um, you can do HGS GET at the moment, but you need then to have gone via the DAC access. Uh, but it shouldn't be that hard to put it into Galaxy. I think the phase one of the beacons, though, just return whether it's true or false. So you, we won't get much data back. And the idea of that is also to protect the privacy of the individuals behind those beacons as well, especially for the medical research. Thank you, Andrew. So we have uh, time for a couple more questions. If anyone wants to, to write a question. Uh, otherwise, can you go to the last slide? You can still write questions while I announce the, the next two webinars. As I told you before, uh, this is a um, webinar that is part of, an, of a series, of a webinar series on how fair are you. So we still have two more webinars in this series. One of them is in two weeks on how to make training fair. And this would be at the same time as, uh, as this one today on Thursday, the 18th of March, delivered by Anna Swan and Sarah Morgan. And then on the 15th of April, it's an, a one about ethics and LC consideration regarding this uh, time. So from fair to fair data sharing. Uh, so if you are interested in any of these uh, webinars, uh, you can visit our uh, the Seneca project website uh, to check the information about them and register there. And if there are no more questions uh, we'll leave it here so thank you very much everybody for attending and th thank you andrew for your presentation and thank you for your time as well